reality for you and your family? If so, it's time to form a union. Don't be denied the wages and benefits you deserve. Come together in a union with the power of numbers. A union is not a privilege, it's your right, and it will make a difference. Contact Teamsters Local 1932, a powerful and successful labor union in San Bernardino by visiting teamsters1932.org backslash organize to start today. Are you underpaid and overworked? Is a living wage and employee benefits like affordable health care more of a dream than a reality for you and your family? If so, it's time to form a union. Don't be denied the wages and benefits you deserve. Come together in a union with the power of numbers. A union is not a privilege, it's your right, and it will make a difference. Contact Teamsters Local 1932, a powerful and successful labor union in San Bernardino, by visiting teamsters1932.org backslash organize to start today. I'm Rick Smith, host of The Rick Smith Show, inviting you to listen to my show during the noon hour every weekday right here on KCAA. My show is sponsored locally by Teamsters 1932, a strong union with 14,000 members in the IE. Our message is clear. Unions improve the lives of working people. You have a right to form and join a union. So go to Teamsters1932.org and get started now. Located in the heart of San Bernardino, California, the Teamsters Local 1932 Training Center is designed to train workers for high-demand, good-paying jobs in various industries throughout the Inland Empire. If you want a pathway to a high-paying job and the respect that comes with a union contract, visit 1932trainingcenter.org to enroll today. That's 1932trainingcenter.org. Are you looking for a good union job? The Inland Empire's 14,000 member strong Teamsters Local 1932 has opened a training center to get working people trained and placed in open positions in public service clerical work and in jobs in the logistics industry. This is a new opportunity to advance your career and raise standards across the region. Visit 1932trainingcenter.org to enroll today. That's 1932trainingcenter.org. Are you graduating high school soon and wondering what to do next? College is one option, but why not consider the high paying jobs made possible by union power? Labor Union Teamsters Local 1932 has opened a training center to get you into the high school to high paying job pipeline. You'll learn all the skills needed to excel in opportunities across industries. Visit 1932trainingcenter.org to enroll today. That's 1932trainingcenter.org. Welcome, brothers, sisters, working class heroes. This is the Rick Smith Show. Thanks so much for being here. Hey, new line, new line. I love it. I, this history, history. We found out. I don't effing care if they have weapons. That's going to be right up there with you know, government of, for, and by. Uh, we the people should not perish from the earth. You know, Abe Lincoln, that's right up there with, with Franklin Roosevelt. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Uh, JFK and the ask not what you can do, what the, your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Or even Ronald Reagan, you know, Mr. Gorbachev, Jones, open up this gate and tear down this wall. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We've now got the, the orange menace. I don't effing care if they've got weapons. They're not here to hurt me. They're not here to hurt me. Take the effing mags away. Let my people in. Let my people in. They can march to the Capitol from here. Let the people in. Take the mags away. Yeah, yeah. I, I can just see that now. It's going to be on a giant, giant billboard. Yeah, that's, that's. Welcome to America. Take the mags away. Let the the 
be faithful. Now, the other one is, yeah, let them hang. Let them hang Mike Pence. History, my friends, history in the making. And and what did what did our corporate controlled for profit right wing conservative media focus on today? Was it that that you know, we had a president that wanted his vice president hung? Was it the fact that he was OK with the people who were there being armed with weapons and over <laughs> over over armed? Uh, you know, you know, overwhelmed the Capitol Police. Was it was was that the story? No, 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 that was not the story. No, no. What we got was ketchup on the wall. We got flying hamburgers. That's what we got. Flying hamburgers. Yeah, occasionally, evidently, evidently, that's the big thing. People were shocked, shocked, shocked. I tell you, we had a president who threw temper tantrums. And I'm going, um, hello, uh, uh, seriously. This is what this is what we're focusing on today, that there was ketchup dripping down the wall, that the worst thing, the worst thing this guy could have done was throw his dish against the wall. Seriously, that's what we're focusing on. Flying hamburgers. Never mind. Never mind that he wanted this vice president. Hun. <laughs> I mean, oh, my gosh. I, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised. Now, look, you know, I'll, I'll be honest. I, I woke up looking for this stuff today. I woke up looking for the absurd, for the ridiculous media culture that we have that folk, that gives us the shiny stuff, a good, healthy dose of outrage candy to keep us, you know, focused in the wrong direction. I'm, I'm expecting that. And of course, you were waiting for the right wing voices to attack Cassidy Hutchinson. Of which, you know, the first thing here, here's 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 the reality. This is why I, I believe what she had to say. One, her career as a, a, a MAGA zealot over uh, the Kool-Aid that she drank. It, it, it's over uh, the, the path she was on that she could have led a very comfortable life in over. More importantly, if you remember the first response from the, the former guy was not that she's a liar. No, no. Not that anything she was saying was untrue. No, no. It wasn't that. No, no. It was to, to attack and diminish her. I don't know who she was. You know, attack her character, her. It wasn't about what she was saying. No, no, because true. You know, and this is what they do. It's all about, it's all about the deflecting. Now they let the the other stuff to the right wing minions, who then are gonna you know try and pick pieces apart here and there. Oh, you know, wait a second. You know, John, here here's the reality. You know, Donald Trump's so fat he can't go after the steering wheel. Doesn't mean he didn't try. Doesn't mean he didn't make an attempt. Now, did the was the attempt successful? Because one of my favorite cartoons of the day are. You know, you know, a tiny child like Trump with little baby hands, you know, trying to get around the neck of a giant, you know, so, Secret Service agent who's just kind of like, you know, get off me, old man. You know, I, I get that. It didn't mean he didn't try. So, yeah, that's that's been the fun part. Now, for me, again, the what came out of the hearing, uh, what came out of Cassidy Hus Hutchinson's uh, testimony, the, the big stuff for me was. As I said, our quote of the day, take down the, the freaking mags. Uh, let all the people with weapons that he knew had weapons, because for those who have been longtime listeners, you may remember on January 6th, on the day of the insurrection, I was questioning how and why all of these people had things. I don't know, like metal flagpoles. How do you get those? Because I've been to protests at the Capitol. They only let you have cardboard tubes, not even aluminum tubes like the Bush years. Cardboard tubes, no metal, no no metal flagpoles with eagles on the top, no weapons like that. You're not allowed to have that. And now we find out because of Miss Hutchinson's testimony that the uh, the criminals who came armed and ready for the insurrection, because they knew what was going on, because it was pre-planned. They didn't go through the, the mags, which upset the Donald. 
because he wanted his people right up close. He needed the, he wanted the photo op. And again, his vanity. This is the part that I think people should be focused on. The fact that he was more concerned about his vanity and his, his size, his crowd size. You know, all of my people loving really close to me. It's not enough that they were there with weapons ready to, to overthrow a government for him. No, no. They had to be a little bit closer. They had to get in the photo op. They had to make sure that the crowd size photo was there. I mean, this is this is amazing. And to have the the mega world go, no, no, it's all it's all it's all a lie. It's all made up. It's all it's all no good. We got to figure out something. We found out that the House Minority Leader told Trump not to come to the Capitol. Don't do it. Don't do it. You got the White House Counsel saying, don't do it. Unimaginable amounts of crimes. Still wanted to do it. Because, again, above the law. Nothing, nothing going to stop him. And this is where you start coming to the reality that that these people, they, they don't, this isn't about democracy. This isn't about the will of the people. This isn't, this isn't about, this isn't about America. This isn't about, this is about ego. This is about one guy and a whole bunch of people attempting to appease him because he's brainwashed a generation. And I'm, I'm still struggling with this. Uh, I'm still struggling with the fact that there are still in this moment People who are going to look at that testimony and oh no, she's she's making stuff up. Understand this this twenty six year old woman. She could have been on easy street. She could have been. She could have kept her mouth silent. She could have taken the threats from whoever is twisting arms and and making those you know hey you got a nice career there shame if something happened. We also found out that there's somebody. And I'm hoping we find out who it is very soon. Somebody going around going, hey, you know, uh, you know, you might uh, might want to stay loyal. Uh, you know, you, you, yeah, good things happen to people who stay loyal. Yep. Love to hear your thoughts. 1-866-416-RICK. 1-866-416-7425. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm 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 fascinated by some of the news coverage that I've seen lately. Uh, the Michael Flynn thing hasn't gotten a lot of attention, uh, other than, uh, you know, hey, you know, a guy who praised the peaceful transfer of power and had you know talked at length about how it, it makes us exceptional, now pleads the fifth when asked if he supported the the said concept. Found that interesting, you know. Uh, the fact that both Rudy Giuliani and Mark Meadows both asked Trump for pardons, I think that's interesting. Uh, we're finding out a lot more. And oh, by the way, here's the good news today. Uh, the, the former White House counsel, Pat Cipollone, uh, he has been subpoenaed to testify. Now, this is one of these moments, one of those moments where I go, did he get subpoenaed because uh, they, they demanded it? Or, or, or did he get subpoenaed because he needs the subpoena so that he has the cover to go, hey, they made me come in. Uh, that, uh, I, I, no, no. Uh, going to be interesting to see what the guy who said the, uh, <laughs> the suicide pact stuff. Going to be interesting to see what he's got to say. I hope we get to see it. I hope, I hope we do. But this is, this is, this is fascinating stuff. And oh, by the way, my congressman's name, Scott Perry, came up again. Uh, in that hearing, again, somebody who reportedly has asked for a pardon. We now know that he was in talks uh, with Trump about going to the Capitol. He was, he was there too. So again, a lot of questions for my congressman Scott Scott Perry, uh, the Brigadier General. Again, somebody I find very scary and very very dangerous in this in this moment. Let's go to the phones. Got Alice on one. Alice, how are we doing? We're doing. Yeah, I'm like you. It's like the uh, media is trying to divert on on some things, and it's just really ridiculous. And I'm thinking to myself, you know what? 
had one Democrat's name came up doing anything illegal, it would be splashed all over the place, and they would be making such a big deal out of it. It's just not even funny. Yep. No, and the other part of this is, you know, you, you now look back at how unprepared the Capitol Police were. And you think about it from the frame that Trump knew that every one of that these people, his the very best people, his people, the people who weren't there for him but willing to hang Mike Pence, how heavily armed they were. And then you look at the cops and what they were armed with. Most of them were just, you know, had their batons and just, had, oh, oh, and little shields. They were wolf, woefully unprepared for what was going on. And this was, I argue, planned. Oh, I agree with you. And, you know, everyone at that point in time on January 6th, and for like a week, two weeks afterward, everyone was saying, everyone that wasn't a Republican, that is, was saying, why did they get in there with weapons? How did they do that? Why weren't the cops prepared? And we knew, we all suspected that it, but now we have confirmation, I guess. Yeah, well. It'll be interesting to see what Cipollone has to say. Uh, are, you, are you upset about the China, though? I mean, because that's what we're supposed to be upset about, the, the ketchup on the wall, the broken China, the hamburgers against the wall. I guess that's what we're supposed to be upset about. It, uh, hey, you know <laughs> what? That sounds like Melania's problem, not mine. <laughs> well, you think she's on her hands and knees cleaning up the dishes? No, 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 no. <laughs> that's never oh, no, happened. She's, from what from what I understand... She's living in Maryland with her parents in a house that she bought. Well, yeah. She's not even living with him. Well, so you know, hey. Uh, oh that's, well, that that's their deal. I, I, I I'm not don't care. None of my business. Let them let them deal with whatever they got to deal with. Uh, but appreciate the thoughts, yep. Alice. Uh huh. Take care. Great stuff. No, I look. You know. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm clearly not all that concerned about the ketchup and the and the, and the hamburger, uh, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. One eight six six four one six Rick. One eight six six four one six seven four two five. Gonna take a quick break. Right back here on the other side. Uh, what do you think? I mean, is it is it is it that big of a deal? The hamburger, the ketchup on the wall. Do you think Melania was on her hands and knees scrubbing the the, the carpet? You, you think you think no, no, not a chance. Uh, quick break. Right back. Stick around. From the steel mills of Pennsylvania, to the auto factories of Michigan, to the modern makers movement, manufacturing makes our nation great. I'm Scott Paul, president of the Alliance for American Manufacturing. We bring business and labor together to advocate for policies that everyone can agree on. Together, we can strengthen manufacturing and create good paying American jobs. Help us keep it made in America. So, uh, R&B singer R. Kelly sentenced to 30 years in prison. Good for him. Uh, evidently, a uh, sex trafficking case. Uh, along with the, what's her name? The uh, Giselle Maxwell, I think that's how you say her name. She got 20 years. A lot of people in the sex trafficking thing. A lot of sexual abuse stuff. Uh, getting some, some serious time. Uh, yeah, not, not, not so much in the religious community, though. Not so much there. Uh, as the FBI has opened what they're calling a sweeping probe of clergy uh, in New Orleans, evidently a bunch of sex abuse cases there, and just in time for the end of Roe versus Wade, and and what I've been saying is uh, is going to be a, a conservative pivot to reinvigorating the social safety net. This is one of those moments where I, I I'm telling you, I think this is going to happen. I'll mark the words, and I got a bunch of pushback from people. No, no. You know, conservatives hate poor people. Yeah, they hate poor people. I didn't, said, I didn't say they were going to help them. I said they're going to pivot to social programs that they can privatize. And 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 someone said, well, you have to explain that because I don't quite get what you're saying. If you remember the George Bush years, this is this is my argument. If you remember the George Bush years, everything was about faith-based initiatives. Remember that phrase, faith-based initiatives. We were going to give a bunch of money to faith-based organizations. 
the do-gooder folks in the name of God Incorporated to go out and do supposedly the good work that they're, they're, they're supposed to be doing. Now, are there some that do? Yeah, I think there are. Uh, do I think most of them are, are, are spinning their wheels and wasting? Absolutely. Do I think most of the money that we give in tax breaks to churches is a horrible waste of, of tax dollars? Yes. I think we should be taxing churches like anybody else. Uh, they should be paying their fair share like everybody else. Uh, because I'm sorry, I just don't see the, the value uh, in the big picture, in the aggregate. That said, doesn't mean I'm anti-religion. Uh, I believe everybody should you know, follow your conscience, follow your, your, your creator, follow your God, follow whatever you want. That is your right. Uh, that's what you do. I, I do my thing. You do yours. But I shouldn't have to subsidize and pay for yours. It's that simple. But during the Bush years, they gave a whole boatload of money to different organizations to do community work. And because conservatives have been getting beat up for years about the fact that they don't really give a rat's behind about the homeless. They don't really care about you know, hungry children. They really don't care about the poor. They, you know, they, they really don't care about the downtrodden. Now, remember, the, the religious people are the people who are supposed to be the ones out there healing the sick and uh, taking care of the elderly and, and, and worrying about the downtrodden. That's, that's supposed to be what Jesus was all about, right? Uh, so the faith-based initiatives were supposed to be, reward those people doing the good work, and that's how we were going to provide the social safety net. We don't need evil government. We need people closest to the problem. This is what the argument was. And they, they blew a bunch of money on this. And honestly, the, the results were, were minimal. Uh, well, there was some good done, but for the, for the most part, the results were minimal. A lot of tax dollars went into feeding a machine. That's what's going to happen here. Uh, there, and you're already seeing a ramping up of a lot of these organizations and, and now the pivot of, hey, you know, now we'll help you, you know, get the health care you need. We'll help you get the, you know, the, the food service you need. We'll help you get all the services you need. You just, you come through us. And as I argued, I've, there are certain groups locally that I don't deal with. Uh, there are certain organizations that I, I just, you know, because of their stance on, We'll only help you if you get into our religious track. Uh, we'll only give you food or shelter or, or you know, assistance if you, you follow our, our mission. And I don't think that that's how it should be. I'm, I'm someone who believes you help someone, and, and if they want to come to your mission, then that's one thing. But to mandate it, to require it, that's a problem for me. And, and I've, I've not worked with those groups. This is... This is what I, I see us going for as a matter of policy, as a matter of, of addressing those programs and the pivot for conservatives to now say that they care about the, the children that are be forced being born. Uh, they don't care about them now. And, and I think that's important to realize. They've always been against social spending on, on food stamps. Uh, I mean, think about what they just did uh, with the extra 250 bucks a month for the poorest families in this country. Uh, absolutely under no circumstances where they were going to allow that to continue. And as I said back then, you know, think of how cruel that was. Because I remember as a kid being, you know, you know poor and you know, not knowing it, not knowing that it wasn't right, normal, natural, good, any of those things, that, that we were struggling so much that there wasn't food in the house at the end of the month that my mother was always worried about us being evicted, that there was always a concern of you know, keeping the lights on, or, or you, you get the picture. But that little bit of money you know, gave them that, like Joe Biden says, a little bit of breathing room. Gave them that little bit of, hey, there's going to be food at the end of the month, a little bit of, of, a, little bit of a cushion. And then to show them what was possible, to say this is how it could be, and then to just snatch it away especially right after Christmas. Merry Christmas. In the most religious time of the year, we're going to make sure that you go back into poverty. Remember them for that, because that's who they are. So when they come and say, no, now we care about the poor and the homeless and the hungry, and we care about you know, the elderly, and we care about all the people we've been dumping on for decades, think about it in the frame of faith-based initiatives that they're going to propose is all about funneling tax dollars through poor, private or religious organizations into campaign dollars for these people that line their pockets with. 
because that's how this game is going to be played. And oh, by the way, we're going to enrich a couple more really rich charlatan preachers. So you're going to get another one to maybe own another stadium somewhere. You're going to get another one who wants a $60 million jet. You're going to get another one who wants, uh, uh, you know, more. While there are people in their congregation and in their eyes shot who are going to bed hungry, who are going to sleep on the street, who are going without health care, who are, who are not getting the medicine and the, the medical attention that they need, who aren't getting, you know, the education that they, they should be getting. This is my problem with, with conservative ideology. This is my problem with conservatism. Talk a good game, follow through, not there. All this, this preaching about privatization, we'll let the market decide. Well, the market sadly decides that only the well-connected and the, the, the affluent get what they need. While kids like me growing up in the place like I did will get nothing. And that, that's where my problems begin and why we have to st we have to really start fighting back against this. I'd love to hear your thoughts. You can email me, Rick, at therigsmithshow.com. Going to take a quick break right back. Stick around. If you missed any portion of the problem program, make sure you grab the podcast. Uh, always there, always available, wherever you get your podcasts. Back after this. Calling all builders. All welders and roofers, engineers and electricians, calling all brick masons and boilermakers, steel workers and steam fitters. Your country is calling you to rebuild America, to create a cleaner, safer, more prosperous future for all. Tackling climate change, this is the job of our lifetime. It's time to build back better. Let's get to work. It doesn't matter what kind of weather. It doesn't matter what time of day or night. When Mother Nature's done her worst, the only thing that matters to us is keeping the lights on for you. The hardworking women and men of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, dedicated to keeping the power on in communities all across the country. Because when bad weather strikes, we know what matters most. IBEW, the power professionals. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So on Thursday, you're going to have Justice Stephen Breyer retiring. He's going to officially leave the Supreme Court, and Ketanji Brown-Jackson will be sworn in uh, as his replacement. Just in time for the uh, the EPA decision. Yay! That ought to be fun. Uh, but yeah, the, the, he's off into the sunset, uh, and we'll now see what happens going forward. Also... Uh, it looks like Georgia, a little sanity down in the Georgia race. Raphael Warnock has a double-digit lead over Herschel Walker. Uh, I, I wonder how much has to do with the road decision or how much of, of it is just Walker's such a bad, crazy candidate. Uh, but, yeah, we'll see. We'll see how much this road decision plays into the November elections. Here to share some thoughts on, well, where we are where we're going, and maybe uh, how important the ketchup on the walls and the broken dishes and the hamburger on the floor uh, really are. I've asked our good friend Bill Shear to come talk with us. Bill's a writer over at the Washington Mo Monthly. Bill, thanks for taking time for us. Always a pleasure. So, um, you paying attention to the big hearings, are you? Uh, I am, as best I can. Uh, so, I'm sure, like like uh, the rest of the mainstream corporate-controlled for-profit media, you were outraged about ketchup on the wall and the broken dishes. I'm sure that <laughs> that is where your focus was. Um, did, did he lunge or did he not lunge? This, this is this is the crucial the crucial question. Uh, look, I, I I think no matter what's happening political here, history is being recorded. We're seeing in very granular detail that Donald Trump tried to overturn a legitimate election and went to absurd, ridiculous lengths to do so. Uh, I, I mean, the, the hopeful aspect of it, in my opinion, is that I do think the Constitution held. You, had, you literally had a president of the United States doing everything he could think of to uh, trample on a legitimate election, and he could not do it because the Constitution and the laws do not allow him to do it. Um, but there's no mistaking what he wanted to do and, and how determined he was to do it. 
he wanted the vice president to be hung. I mean, uh, when today's news was about ketchup on the wall, I, I didn't see many stories about him being okay with his number two being hung. Bill. Or being okay with people armed showing up at his rally so long as they didn't hurt him. I mean, uh, exactly. Some, uh, I mean, there there is this weird pairing of how extreme he was willing to go and how ridiculous the plot was. I mean, this is, I mean, it wasn't, I mean, this, this is the Keystone Cops operation. Yet at the same time, it literally uh, uh, could have led to worse violence than what we actually saw because he was so cavalier and glib about people being armed on his behalf. Yeah, I mean, yeah, take the bags down, take them down, I want... <laughs> I want my people closer because because he, he wanted the photo op. I mean, think about think about what the messaging and the, think about what historians in a hundred years are going to look back at this moment, and and think about about this that administration. Uh, and the the positive thing is that we know, we have the evidence, we have the documentation, uh, in large part because he, as much as he demanded loyalty of people, so many people were not loyal to him because what he wanted to do was so insane that they could not hold their tongues they felt it necessary to tell the public what has happened and so we do know what he did uh our eyes are wide open and i i mean i can't predict what the republican party is going to do with it uh but you do see some evidence that even people who are would not i would not call moderates in the republican party that some of them even even want to move on from this and don't want Trump to define what their party is. Yeah. Now, now I guess the big question I have for you, because we had this conversation a while ago. Uh, do you think this leads anywhere? Do you think uh, any any indictments eventually happen? Do you think this goes? Because I said from the beginning, there's no way he's ever going to be held accountable. That We, we just don't do that. Mm -hmm. I got to tell you, these hearings have made me question that a little, not a lot, but question that a little bit because, wow, wow, there's so much here. Well, it only puts the pressure on Attorney General Garland. Um, if he's not going to indict, he's got to explain why. And that's, I mean, it's a tough position. I'm not someone who is inclined to uh, berate Garland for the for um, being careful here because it's, it's not a light thing to indict a former president, someone who is clearly getting up to run for president again because it can so easily be considered a political act. Uh, but... There is such overwhelming evidence here that it does make it hard to look away. Uh, and and that's one of the values of this commission, because if Garland does indict, I, I think to a lot of people, it's not going to seem political. It's going to seem obligatory because of what we know. Yeah. Now, the other question I have is if Trump does run again, you know, who will who will sign up to be his number two, knowing that he was willing to send his his former number two to the wolves? Well, I, I, you know, it's a little hard to know of the people who are going to Iowa and going to New Hampshire. Are these people who want to run themselves or are they running to be Trump's number two? Do they believe that it's not politically feasible to oppose him uh, in a Republican primary and they just want to suck up to him? So if he does run, he'll pick that person for number two and that person will look good in the eyes of Republican voters in 28 and 32. Uh, or are they running? Are they, are they making these moves because they think Trump is uh, losing steam, and they want to be there when there's a sense that his time has passed? Yeah. Now you're, you, you, Bill, are one of the most level-headed people I know. Uh, I, I've got a lot of friends saying, "No, this is this is going to be a this is going to be a wave election with the, the hearings, with Roe, with all this stuff going on. You know, Democrats are going to they're going they're going to they're going to sweep this election." Um. You think that's possible? I, I don't, but I'm curious what you think. Possible that Democrats can come back or possible that we have a red wave? The, the, the Democrats can come back. It's possible. I mean, look, you, you have not seen a lot of heartening data up until this point. Uh, you know, with Biden's numbers are low, inflation's high, uh, there hasn't really been much of a – I mean, even – I mean, every time the Democrats get a win of some sort, it gets undercut. I mean, the day they actually pass a gun safety bill is the day that 
Roe v. Wade is overturned. So they can't even take that victory lap. Uh, when the infrastructure bill passed and Bill Buck better got stabbed in the back by Joe Manchin, you know, a few weeks later. So they haven't been able to, to string together the kind of victories that make people feel that this administration is on track. Uh, so uh, in the eyes of history, you'd say this is going to be a disaster for Democrats. But uh, this decision, this Roe v. Wade decision uh, is so seismic. I mean, I can't tell you today whether it's going to be impactful come November or not, but I don't think it's a small thing. Uh, and uh, and when it, it, I mean, I think I think a lot of things have to come together. You know, you, I think inflation has to come down at least somewhat. I think Democrats probably need to get some kind of reconciliation bill passed so that base gets some some motivation again. Uh, but if you're able to go to the public and say uh, this, not only is this decision bad, but Republicans up and down the ballot are determined to make it even worse, to take away as much of your reproductive freedom as they can possibly think of, don't let them. Uh, that is not an irrelevant factor to this midterm. And so I would not go into this fall assuming that it's all over. Yeah, I, it, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. You listen to The Rick Smith Show. We're here with Bill Shear. Uh, he's a contributor, a uh, political writer over at the Washington Monthly. We'll get links out on social media. I take a look at his writing. Uh, now, you know, you had Cassidy Hutchinson uh, testifying. Uh, immediately they came out and they attacked her. Trump uh, attacked basically the, the, the normal Trump attack. Uh, I barely knew who she was. She's nobody. You know, that, that kind of nonsense. Didn't say that what she said wasn't true. Uh, now you have other people who are saying that they're going to come and testify, I guess, uh, the people who they, who claim they didn't say what she said, she said they said, uh, are they going to testify? I mean, I, I know they've thrown this out there. Do they uh, do they come forward? Do they actually testify, or is this performative? Much like Jenny Thomas, I look oh, man, at Jenny Thomas immediately. Jenny Thomas is like, I can't wait to testify and clear things up, and then her lawyer is like, Well, let's walk that back. <laughs> I mean, I can't I can't mind read. Uh, I don't know what they're willing to say publicly or not what what we do know is there was previous reporting that trump wanted to go to the capitol and had conflict with the secret service who would not let him go trump said that himself in an interview with the washington post the interview was in april and it was published in early june so cassidy's testimony is in line with what was previously known and publicly reported there may be little details again like do you lunge at the wheel do you throw the dish you know th th these are really you know tangential to the main storyline which is trump has said himself he wanted to go to the capitol and the secret service wouldn't let him that is i think much more crucial than some of the other smaller details now i'm waiting for the right wing to say see the secret service held him hostage they wouldn't let him go where he wanted to go <laughs> So now, um, now they've subpoenaed this uh, the Cipollone guy. What are we expecting out of this? Anything? Is there, I guess the first question is, uh, is this a, a subpoena that uh, he will fight, or is this one of those subpoenas, the only way I'll come in and talk is if I'm compelled? What do you think? Uh, I mean, it, again, that goes beyond what, what I know. Uh, I, I do feel like this commission has been pretty savvy. They're not just throwing random things at the wall. They're calling you in to testify. It's because they know something already. Uh, and again, I can't know if he is a cooperative witness or a hostile witness at this point, um, but they clearly know things already that they believe he can shed further light on. Uh, and if he doesn't testify, imagine whatever it is the commission does know in relation to him, we will find out. Yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting. Now, there's some of these, you know, as they're playing bits and pieces of the, the interviews that they did, there's some of these that I'd really like to, just, to see all of them. Uh, the Hirschman, the attorney, the, that Hirschman, I'd love to see all of his, all of his testimony. Um, I mean, I imagine we're going to get it all at some point. I mean, the, the, the commission seems pretty strategic in what they release publicly. Now, if, and if you want to be a, a cynic on the pro-Trump side, it might seem staged to you. You know, they're, they're cherry picking what they're putting out there. They're building a narrative. Uh, but. I mean, they clearly are trying to tell a story, and in some ways, it's why it's so compelling. Right. They're prosecuting uh, a case. And look, here's here's right. where here's where I believe 
and, I, and I've already gotten some pushback yesterday. I got a lot of pushback from my Democratic friends. I believe this is all Liz Cheney's handiwork. I don't believe there are any Democrats involved in, in, in crafting this message because they're horrible at messaging. They're horrible <laughs> at communicating. They're horrible at this. I believe this is all Liz Cheney's handiwork. Um, I, I mean, they certainly they're only going to go as, when, when it is bipartisan. It is bipartisan. Um, it may not be bipartisan the way Jim Jordan would have liked it, but it's bipartisan. Uh, I mean, I have friends who are upset that Liz Cheney is getting such a um, – uh, it's, it's being so beloved by Democrats now based on what she's said of Democrats in the past. But just as a, just objectively speaking, this never would have been on prime time if Liz Cheney wasn't there. Um, Liz Cheney has basically told him, I'm willing to be front and center. I'm willing to make this a bipartisan duo. I will tell you what I think is going to be the most compelling. Uh, it, is, it, it is immeasurable, uh, the impact she's had on this. It doesn't exonerate her from every position or other that in the past, but it's just a plain fact that if this was an all-democratic operation, it would not land the same way. It would not resonate the same way. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and, and if there if there's some reason to believe that what they're saying isn't the full story, well, Trump, well, Cipollone, well, uh, uh, Steve Bannon, show me. Yeah. Show me the evidence of what they're saying here is wrong. Yeah. Show up, testify, Give me your documents, give me your text, give me your emails and prove it. Yep. And don't show up at the Four Seasons Landscaping Facility. Uh, show up in the chair, put your hand on that book that you love, claim to love so much, and swear to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth. So help you, God, and <laughs> under threat of perjury and going to jail. Yeah, I'm, I'm all in favor of it. In fact, as much time as you need, run and motorboat and, and, and grandstand all you want. You know, and if we get to actual trials, if there are if there are actual indictments, uh, uh, we'll we'll have that back and forth, whether the, whether the Trumpers like it or not. Yeah. So last question, I I, I got to get to uh, this this Roe versus Wade decision. Um, how how big of a deal this is this going to be in November? Well, yeah, I uh, I think it could be. I I'm I can't say it will be because a lot of things have to happen, um, namely. Uh, it has to stay front and center. Uh, I mean, I don't want to argue that I'm wishing for this to be the case, but it's just the plain fact. Uh, people have to feel the implementation of what Republicans are doing. We what we had in Texas the past year, which makes a lot of Republicans think, oh, this is no big deal. Abortion's not top of mind. Um, it's not going to play the same way Democrats think it's going to because this is just, this is just the fact. Most people in Texas in the past year were still able to get abortions. There's data on this. It's about, it's about a 10 percent reduction from the past year because most people either crossed state lines in Oklahoma or Louisiana or got pills in the mail. It's very hard, even though pills are illegal in Texas, it's very hard to enforce that because they're sent out of state in nondescript boxes. Uh, so if if access was still very prevalent even in the states where it's being banned and you, people weren't feeling it and there weren't a lot of stories about it then maybe it's not such a big deal however we're having such a broad swath of land where it's being outlawed or nearly totally outlawed so it's not gonna be so easy for a lot of people to cross state lines um now of course the pills are another story but pills can't cover everybody there's gonna be there, there can be complications that pills can't can't handle uh can't deal with uh, so the more we're hearing stories about people's difficulty getting abortions, uh, the more it's going to be in the news, the more people it's going to it's going to feel real to people. And there's data that came out in The Washington Post just, just this past uh, week. Forty of the 50 states have a pro-choice majority. So that that covers a lot of states where Republicans are in charge and they're banning it or, or, or almost totally banning. it. So there's a lot of ingredients where this could become a very, very big deal. Uh, in very, it, it, it's not just like deep red states who are doing this. You're talking a lot of purple states, yeah. Arizona, Florida, Georgia, Texas, uh, Wisconsin, where the governor doesn't even want it, but there's a 19th century law that's not, that's not been resurrected. Ohio. Uh, these are places that have governor's races, that have attorney general's races, that have state legislative races, as well as, well in some cases, U.S. Senate races. A lot of opportunities here for Democrats to say, Whatever we were mad about us before, these people are up to no good. They want to take away fundamental rights that are going to, that are going to affect your lives and your, and your daughter's lives, and you don't want that. No, no, you're absolutely right. And 
uh, that when we start hearing the stories of emergency rooms and, and women dying and, and we start you know, seeing the families on the evening news of, of pointing fingers at this as being the reason, uh, I, I, think, I think you're right. I think it has to stay top of the mind. But sadly, uh, I do fear people are, are going to suffer uh, enormously over this. But, Bill, I appreciate the time and the thoughts. As always, good stuff. My pleasure. Good to talk to you. Our good friend Bill Shear. I'll make sure you check out the work that he does over at the Washington Monthly. I take a quick break. Right back. Stick around. You're listening to the Rick Smith Show. We're working people on the talk. I took two years of electric in high school, and I was the only girl in the class there. Here, I'm the only girl as far as installers go. I'm a single mom, too. I joined the union because it gave me options for health care and life insurance so that I know my son's taken care of. I like what I do. Like, this is the best job I've ever had. You think solar panels is more like California. You wouldn't think Appalachia would have any. It would be smart if the government would invest more in clean energy resources. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So it's, it's, I think Bill's right. I mean, this is one of those things where I think the, the Republican majority, are they're, they're saying, hey, we're hoping that it just goes away. Hoping that, yeah, there'll, there'll be a little outrage. People will be upset for a little bit. But eventually they'll calm down. They'll forget. There'll be another outrage. We'll do something worse. Uh, like uh, evidently on Thursday, we're expecting the uh, the West Virginia decision against the EPA, where uh, the, the Supreme Court is expected to decide that uh, uh, the EPA will do be, be able to do nothing, nothing to address climate change. Uh, sorry, EPA. Uh, yeah, it's your job to regulate. You know what what happens with the environment, and your job to ensure that you know people keep the the air and the water clean and safe. The Clean Water, Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act that, you know, made the air breathable and the water drinkable, you know, that stuff. No, we won't be able to do that ever again. Yeah, congratulations. That's, that's where we're going. Uh, now, that'll be an outrage. You know, people will be upset about that. And the, the thought is, is, you know, it'll be, you know, one cause after another. And because I've had I've had conservative friends say, you know, that, you know, liberals are, are, are cause heads. You know, they go from one one thing after another that they don't stick with things very long. Not untrue, but these things I'm hoping are going to be the ones that stick. Uh, look, you know, when Janice hit, you know, people were upset for a little bit, but most people are like, yeah, you know, it's, yeah, it's just those public sector workers, screw them. And you go, no, 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 th those are workers. Uh, you allowed a segment of, of your own workforce, of, of, of your, your class solidarity to be eroded away. Uh, again, injury to one being an injury to all. You allowed those public sector workers to get screwed over. And there was a little bit of outrage for a moment, and then, they, well, they moved on. And now suffering the consequences. Uh, this, this can't be one of those. This can't be another, oh, well, we lost, uh, move on. This has got to be that, there's a line in the sand now. Uh, that this is, this is too far. Uh, the EPA thing, too far. Saying that, you know, hey, corporate America can do whatever they want. You know, the moneyed interest can do whatever they want. That's a problem. And it's a, it should be a problem for, because again, do we have to go back and learn the lessons of the past? Do we have to go back and, and, and live the tragedies of, of yesteryear? Do my children have to fight the, the battles of their great-grandparents? Is, is that, and look, they do say history repeats itself every hundred years you go through this. And yeah, here we are again. You know, we're rolling right through this. I'm hoping we're smarter. Well, I'm told we're smarter. I'm hoping we actually are. And this is one of those times where you go, how do we get smarter? <laughs> how do we get to where, you know, let's, uh, let's do the right thing now. And this is why, again, this November, so important. And, and look, you know, the way forward here is get rid of the fives. You know, all of the, if right now you know somebody who is still supporting the former guy, forget them. They're, they're unreachable. I don't even talk to them anymore. At this point, they're, they're unreachable. There are some Republicans that are reachable, and I, I've, talk, I, I've good conversations with them. 
they're they're folks that you can have a conversation with. But the fives, you let the fives go. Uh, they're the extreme. They're the the unreachable. The the immovable. Uh, they're they they they're bathing in the Kool Aid. Let them go. That simple. Focus your energy, focus your time, your effort on moving forward, making things better. Back to the idea of how do we expand rather than, than tear away? How do we expand our, 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 our pursuit of, of more opportunity? How do we expand our ability to, to lead a better life? It's my thought. Love to hear yours. Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. If you miss any portion of the program, podcast, make sure you download the podcast. Get it wherever you get your favorites, from iTunes to iHeart, Stitcher to Podbean, everywhere in between. Or just go to the ricksmithshow.com. Back after this. It doesn't happen like we think it does. No one rolls the tanks. No armies meet in pitched battle. It happens quietly, little by little. And because so many think it can't happen, it does happen. Little by little, the rules change. It doesn't seem shocking or sudden. And that's the point. Fewer places to vote, longer lines. Don't worry, they say, we're just improving the system. They hope we won't notice the rules are changing because they lost the last election. They hope we just won't care enough to stop them. They believe they can take America away from us and we won't even notice. We know who they are. We know what they want. The question is, who are we? Do we let them get away with it, or do we fight? Democracy is on the ballot. Vote while your vote still counts. The Lincoln Project is responsible for the content of this advertising. You know, I think it's important to share those stories and, and for people to, uh, to understand that this is, this is not something that's easy for a lot of folks. It's, it's difficult, it's, it's private, and it's going to have to become very public because it's, you know, I've been having some conversations with some friends going, look, this isn't, the, there's no undoing this. There's no, there, there's no quick, there's no quick undo button. Uh, there's no, uh, there's no redo, there's no reset on this. Uh, the court has decided, and until politically, you get enough people into the halls of power to, to make this the part of the law. And look, I saw AOC given, given her, her spiel on, uh, on Colbert, you know, on, hey, we need to get rid of the filibuster. Hey, we need to pack the court. We need to do those things. That ain't happening. Uh, it's nice to say, nice to say, not going to happen. What you need to be doing right now is we need to be getting out into the streets. We need to be doing the hard work of organizing people. This is this moment. This is an incredible moment. This is an opportunity to, to reach people that, well, haven't been reached for a very long time. And this, 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 this reaches into so many different places. This is an excellent opportunity for organized labor to begin organizing workers in their workspaces to ensure that corporate America makes sure that women have access to the care that they need. This is that moment, because guess, guess what? Here, 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 let me let you a little secret. The crazy right wing, they're already doing this. The hobby lobbies of the world, they've already done it. They've already denied women contraception. They've, they've already done this work. It's now time to play a lot of catch up. And that's organizing for better wages, better hours, better conditions, better benefits. Benefits being ensuring that people have the care that they need the privacy rights that they need, fighting for family medical leave, fighting for maternity leave, fighting for the things that, that we cannot get legislatively, and then fighting for it legislatively. Again, what's, what's happened in this country has been, and we've been talking about it for, for years here, it is amazing at how easily the working class is divided and sliced and diced and pitted against each other over nonsense over things that affect almost no one. And, you know, I've watched it happen. I've watched firsthand how the right wing took over the lunchroom. I watched firsthand how, how Limbaugh and all of the right wing talking heads co-opted the lunchroom conversation. 
and changed it from, hey, how do we make our lives better? How do we get better wages, hours, conditions, better opportunity for our children, but better, better, you know, better schools, better neighborhoods? You know, how do we make things better? Better. How do we go? How did we go from a movement of gompers? We want more, more of the things that make our lives better, more of the things that make our lives more noble and childhood better. How, how did we go from that to hate and division to I don't care. I don't, I don't care if I get it just as long as they don't. How did we go? How did we get here? And the reality is, is the right wing spent lots of time, energy, and money, focus group testing every phrase, every every email, chain email they send out, every meme, focus group testing, think tank approved, and then they blared it out on their talk radio dominance, you know, cable news, and just just the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy, just just fear and anger, and you know, there's someone coming for you. And it worked. Yeah, you know, I remember the first time, and I, I, I'll never forget this. I'll never forget it. The first time the, the gay marriage issue came up, it was years ago. Uh, it was it was playing on the TV at a restaurant up in uh, mid, uh, upstate New York, uh, just just outside of of Waterbury. Uh, we were at a little diner. I think it was exit. Uh, um, no, not Waterbury, uh, Newburgh, uh, Exit 7 on, on, on 84. We're at a little diner, and there's like, like six of us at a table, and we're all heading up north. And, and, a, and a guy sees, one of the guys sees on the TV um, them talking about, you know, same-sex marriage and how, you know, th there's this fight going on. And, and the guy's like, you know, that's an abomination. It's, it's, it's going to ruin the sanctity of my marriage. And I, I, I'll never forget that phrase going to ruin the sanctity of my marriage and understand this is a guy who had a wife and a couple of kids back in Pennsylvania and a girlfriend and a kid up in Massachusetts <laughs> and I remember at the time going hold on wait a second so those people that you have no idea who they are you've never met you're never going to meet them you don't have, you're never going to come anywhere near somehow billionaire and to CEO the of Lifestyles Del Unlimited Dell Wamsley but you've heard Dell and his team on the radio KCAA now join the Lifestyles Loma Unlimited Linda, team on location AM, in Anaheim 106.5 FM and now 102.3 FM AP News I'm Tim McGuire the young man accused of